Thanks everyone for coming out so early this morning. I'm very lucky, obviously, to be here. You tend to remember the first thing you hear and the last thing you hear on each of these days. It's a great turnout, so thanks for all of that. I've only got about 10 minutes, so the idea is not to actually give you the full story, um, just to give you a, a bit of a snapshot of our company, what we're doing, um, and where we're going to. Um, as was mentioned, we're an aircraft lessor. That is, we own aircraft and we lease them to commercial, only commercial um, aircraft, and we lease them to airlines. Um, we, um, this, the analogy, that, the simplest analogy that I can give you, it's very similar to owning residential property, where you own a house, you borrow money to buy that house, and then you rent it to tenants. The difference in, in aircraft leasing is typically that when you lease a plane to an airline, um, when it's uh, from, from new, the first lease generally runs for 10 or 12 years, typically for our company. So it's very long term, very high visibility in our revenue stream. Um, and, the, and the key to our business model is that typically a plane will live or have an economic life of 25 to 30 years. Under the business model that we use and pretty much which is standard in our industry, each plane will pay itself off halfway through its economic life. So from that point on, it generates enormous amounts of cash and enormous, enormous amounts of profit. Um, my intention today is just to give you a bit of uh, background on the industry, because not too many people know about aircraft um, leasing. Um, a bit of background on the company, um, explain, just touch on our business model, because I just simply just don't have the time. Um, the most important thing that for you to take away um, and for me to explain to you is to explain to you how this company, which is already generating lots of revenue and lots of profit, um, is going to grow by 50% on its balance sheet over the next 18 months. And that's contracted, firm growth, and it's our absolute base case. So that's what I want to try to explain to you in the next nine and a half, nine minutes or so. All the time while we're going to uh, grow at this uh, rate, um, we're going to improve our profitability. And keep in mind, uh, Vation's been around for a few years. We've doubled our balance sheet in the last two years. Our revenue growth is about 25 plus percent per year. Um, we, our last full finance, financial year, we doubled our profit and we doubled our um, EPS. You know, we are earning money, we're paying a dividend, and we've got enormous amounts of growth. There's not too many companies that you'll see today that, does all of, that do all of those things. We've been actually around for about six years, um, and we're, what we're, we're domiciled in Singapore, which is tax advantageous for companies like us, but we are listed on the main board here. Our code on the presentation that I've hopefully most of you have got, there's plenty more down at our stand. Our code's AVAP. Um, and we're here really to raise our profile, and that's because, the because we've really grown in size and scale in the past year or so and evolved the company into a full service leasing company, we can now do all the things that the very large leasing companies in the world do, like GE. GE is the largest company that does what we do on the planet. It has 2,000 planes. We have 24 planes. So we've got a lot of growth, obviously, to do. Um, but the, um, the, the reason why, why we can do everything that we need to do is things like buying aircraft, selling aircraft, extending leases with airlines, marketing to airlines, refinancing debt, going and getting debt from banks. All of those are the key things that you need to do. And we've built a company that can do all of those things. So we're really primed now for growth. But the big statement I made was how we're going to grow by 50% in, in the next 18 months. So I'll get to that in a minute. Today, in terms of the industry, every second plane, every brand new plane, every second brand new plane that is delivered today is bought by a company like us. Airlines don't own their aircraft. Even though you hear British Airways you know, ordering 50 planes, they don't own those 50. They might sell, they'll sell typically half of them to companies like us. And what we do is we're happy to buy, buy them off them and then we get the income stream over that first 10 to 12 years. Then we can extend leases or go and market those planes to other lessors. The reason why we, a company like uh, us exist is that we're far better credit risks than the airlines. They've got their big businesses with lots of people, um, tough businesses to run. Um, and we, um, 
typically lease our planes for the long term. So this is just a quick summary uh, of what, we're, what I'm going to talk about. Um, we're a high growth company. Um, I'll talk about our fundamentals in a minute, but typically we've been growing at 30 plus percent a year and we're going to continue doing that in the next few years. I've talked about our listing. We have 24 aircraft today. Um, those photos are our assets. They're our particular aircraft. Um, 24 today. The 50% growth I was talking about is that in the next 18 months, we're going to deliver these 12 planes. And those planes are our core product, which is this product, which is, this is a ATR 72 turboprop. And we're a bit of a niche supplier um, one of the largest suppliers on the planet for that particular aircraft. ATR is half owned by Airbus, by the way. Um, so they're, they're great. Um, turboprops are far more efficient than, than jets, and they're used for small, small hops, island hopping, trips to Manchester, things like that. On top of the 12 aircraft in the next 18 months that's going to grow our balance sheet by 50%, is that we have a further 27 um, options to buy more of these aircraft. So we've got 24 today, and then in the future, we've got another 39 planes to deliver. So we're going to grow enormously by 150% over the next few years. Um, we focus on the workhorse aircraft, the A320, 737s and the ATRs. We've got 50, just under 50 million shares and our market cap today is 55 million pound. It's about 80 million US dollars because our business is measured in US dollars. We've got net tangible assets in excess of $100. $100 million, sorry. The realisable value, which I'm happy to explain to you at our stand, is over is closer to $200 million. So we're $80 million market cap. We've got realisable value of assets today of close to $200 million. We're, uh, last year we generated $43 million US dollars in revenue. $10 million of that we put to net profit. So we convert $0.25 cents in every dollar of revenue to net profit. Um, this is a bit about the ATR aircraft. We started off just delivering these to Virgin Australia. We've delivered 13 to date, that's half our fleet. We've evolved the company, now we're marketing to airlines all around the world. And in the next short period, we've, well, we've already sold two, and we've got two new customers coming on in the next three months. And we're marketing to aircraft all around the world. As, and then on top of that, we've got the 12 being delivered in the next 18 months. So this is our business model. Now, I haven't got time to explain this, but this is the life cycle of a plane. What it basically says, and please come to the stand and I'll explain it to you, what this basically shows and proves is that for investment by us of $2 million into the purchase of a new aircraft, it generates about $38 million worth of returns over the life of that, 25 year life of that aircraft. Now, two to 38. I think we'll all agree that's a pretty good return. Now, please come to the stand and let me explain how we do that, because I don't have time today. Um, now, I said base case growth. The reason why we've got base case growth of 50% is that not only are we delivering these new ATR aircraft, but the other half of our fleets are jets, A320s. Now, we have a mandate to go and buy early to midlife jets that already have leases attached um, uh, with airlines. And that's what we're going to do. We bought two in the last financial year. So any jets that we buy will be on top of that 50% growth. And this is, our business is quite simple. We generate between 12 and 14% return on the value of each of, our, uh, each of our planes. The cost of our debt is just uh, is 5.1%. So we generate a net yield of 7%. So every aircraft we buy makes us more profitable. Just to, just to finish off now, I said we're, we're a growth company. We've got, why, are, why are we have realisable um, assets of close to $200 million is that all our planes are booked at their cost price, what we buy them as a piece of metal for. But on the next day, they're leased for 10 years. So they have an income stream over 10 years. So they're more valuable than that piece of metal. We can sell that plane on that day. So a $20 million plane on day plus one might be worth $25 million. You know, we've got 13, 13 of those planes with, that we've delivered in the last two years that are like that. 13 times five, six, what's that, $65 million. You know, our market cap, that's not on the balance sheet. Our market cap is only $80 million. Um, we also have the 39 options for future deliveries. We sold one of those for $1.5 million. 
We've got another 39 of them. 39 times one and a half. Um, and so clearly we're trading today at a P of about six. Our peers are at 10 plus. We're trading below net asset value per share. We are undervalued however way you look at it. That's why I'm here to raise our profile. Please come to the stand. <coughs> I'm happy to explain it in more detail. Thank you for your time. What's your stand number? Um, it's, on the, it's just downstairs here over in the far corner. I think it's 56. So just down the stairs over in that uh, far corner. Thank you for your time. All right, good morning, folks. A uh, quick uh, question. Any clinicians in the audience? One. Uh, when I ask a question, Sarah, you're not allowed to answer. Um, thank you very much. We're going to talk about uh, podiatric and vascular medicine today. It's not the sexy end. But if I tell you the survival rate for patients who have a diabetic foot ulcer that won't heal and they have it amputated is worse than every other cancer apart from colon and pancreatic, sorry, lung and pancreatic, I'm trying to get you to understand this is a major problem for all of the world, not just the UK. Um, first of all, let me ask you the question I ask everybody who invests in our company. How does blood circulate around the body? What makes it go round? Clinician. The heart is the, the standard answer. The answer is it does if you're lying flat on the floor. And I hope that this is, this is informative to you. As soon as you stand up and you put about four feet of gravity down, there isn't enough pressure for the blood leaving your foot to make it all the way back up. You depend upon two very powerful pumps in the body, one in the, in the foot itself. So as you walk and your foot does that, it's actually pumping blood. And as your foot moves like this, your calf continues to pump it upwards. That comes into my speech in like three or four slides. Please bear that in mind. In eight minutes, I can't tell you everything about pulse boot. I just want to interest you. We're on stand 27. If you've any further interest, please come and talk to us. And I have to say, a lot of the current investors in our uh, company actually have a relative or a friend who have been touched by uh, diabetes and diabetic foot ulcers. So this is the most keep it simple, stupid product you'll ever hear about in medical technology. Um, it's really easy to explain. And uh, let me give you some reasons why you should invest in, in the product. The, t the technology I can explain to you within like 10 or 15 seconds. The clinical problem it addresses is widespread, and I can prove that. We have a business-to-business -business model, so we're not setting up expensive sales teams all over the place. This is just sell it to distributors who are already marketing similar products. It's really a billion-dollar opportunity, and the more I research it with clinicians across the globe, the more I find that I've underestimated in my numbers how big this uh, opportunity is for us. One of the things that has, has attracted um, investors who, who know the medical technology spaces. I'm not claiming we're going to penetrate the NHS to any great extent. However, we've already got a contract with NHS supply chain to put it on their catalogue. So one of the big barriers to entry into the NHS has, has gone. I say that to show that we're a pretty commercially aware company. Uh, we've got clinical interest from loads of places uh, ready to, to go uh, to try the product when we've got the clinical studies uh, finished, which would be sort of June, July time. We've got um, global experts. If you talk to them, they say, that's fantastic, when can I have it? There's a, a tremendous clinical interest in this product because it's addressing four or five different things uh, that they have needed um, to have improvements to help their patients. We've got the CE mark. Um, we've got some interest from global wound healing companies already talking to us, and we've started the FDA process. So forgive me for going at the speed, guys, but in eight minutes, <coughs> there's a, a buckle load of stuff to go through. So. You will have seen in any you know, of the national publications that diabetes in the UK is a problem, it's rising. It's actually every single country in the world has an increasing problem with diabetes. And it's, uh, it's not just diabetic foot ulcers, there's a lower limb circulation avalanche of problems coming and the clinicians don't know how to handle them. We have some line extensions which we can get into later on at the stand, stand 27. <laughs> Uh, forgive me for showing you two ugly pictures at this time in the morning. At least I didn't switch on smell o vision That's the good news. Um, ischemia is one cause of diabetic foot ulcers. There's not enough arterial oxygenated blood getting down to the toes. Or um, neuropathy, where you can't feel it when you stand on a nail or a stone. You get an injury, it becomes infected, the wound won't heal. These things are hard to heal wounds. 
Uh, the diabetic population will typically have, on any given day, 5 to 15% of the population will have a foot ulcer. Um, and if you look at the lifetime prevalence, up to 25% of diabetics will have a foot ulcer. I'm giving you that to, to sort of bracket how big a problem this can be. Ooh, we're chopping off one leg every 20 seconds due to a diabetic problem uh, globally, and there's about 100 legs per week being amputated in the UK. Think of the cost of making somebody disabled. If you can get that wound to heal and you don't need to amputate and you don't make them disabled, the health economics behind that argument really does stack up quite quickly. Currently, if you have a diabetic foot ulcer, you will be treated with something like this, if you're lucky, if you go to the right centre <coughs> and they don't just opt to chop your leg off quickly. And what this is called is an offloading boot. And what it's designed to do is to take away as much pressure, shear and friction from the wound as possible to give it a chance to heal. The problem with them is they lock your ankle into a 90 degree shape. Go back to my original question to the audience, how does blood circulate around the body? Oxygen needs to get to the wound. Oxygen is transported by the blood. If you've just locked the ankle in position, you've just quietly knackered your plantar pump and your calf pump. So what we've done is built a little battery powered inflating bladder underneath the arch of the foot, which inflates once every 20 seconds. I told you it was simple technology. And we just press the big saggy veins there and it pumps between seven mils and 30 mils of blood back up the leg, allowing fresh oxygenated blood in to try and heal the wound. Very simple uh, solution to a problem. <clears throat> We've also tried to make it look like normal footwear. I actually um, didn't realize how much social stigma applies to these things. If you're clumping about in one of these things, there's a big disincentive to wear it and the compliance rate with standard therapies is very low. We've tried to make ours look like normal footwear, so it's less of a, a social stigma for, for young patients, type one diabetes, they don't want their mates making fun of them. Um, we've had a, an example of a 55-year-old board director so thought it was a sign of weakness to go into the boardroom with one of these things on. If we can give you normal looking footwear, it's a big advantage. We've also built some software into our boot that records the number of hours the patient wears it. Therefore, they can't lie to their clinician. Um, yeah. um, We've, uh, we've got great uh, interest from the clinicians as, as, as to that little piece of software. Uh, you, so you told me you were wearing it all last week, John. Hmm, funny enough, that's not what this little PC says. So we've, we've built in some, some technology the clinician wants. We've built some stuff in for the, for the patient. And I certainly hope um, that we can prove we're, we're less visually ugly than those things. So what are we going to do? We're going to heal the DFUs more efficiently. Uh, we've got trials uh, uh, ongoing in London, Leeds, Tucson, uh, Dublin. So we'll have some clinical evidence mid-year. But it's, um, it's based upon published evidence already. We didn't just make this up. There was a, a way of doing this technique before, but it wasn't mobile. The trick with Pulse Boot is we've made it mobile with a little battery-powered device. So we're going to offload, take the pressure, shear, and friction away. We're going to pump blood. Uh, we're going to get the wound to heal. We're going to improve patient compliance uh, to make it look like normal footwear um, and record the compliance for the clinician. Um, one of the things that the clinician said to us is, all right, if we get this initial diabetic foot ulcer heal, that's great. What we notice is they go back and wear the same blinking shoes that caused the ulcer in the first place. What can you do to help us stop an ulcer coming? So we've made our pumping mechanism removable. So after 12 weeks therapy, the patient goes back to the clinic for the final visit. They take the pumping mechanism out and the patient goes home with a pair of well-made, diabetic-friendly footwear to stop the next ulcer forming. There's great value in that. There's absolutely great value. Uh, again, the clinicians are excited by that. And it works with all other wound healing products. We're an adjunct to therapy. We're not trying to tell Smith and Nephew that your dressings aren't needed anymore. You will still dress the wound. You will still put your whatever substance on. All we'll do is protect the wound and pump blood, get more oxygen to the wound, allow it to heal quicker. So that's what it looks like. It's, um, if you've got fat calves, you need to wear cargo pants. If you've got thin calves, you'll get away with a set of boot cut jeans um, to make it look like normal footwear. So what's the business model? I've said it's very simple to understand. We've made the boot single patient use. There is no way we can decontaminate it between patients. So you sell it to that patient they use it and they keep it. It can't come back in to be recycled. 
It's um, business to business, so people will buy it for us for 30 days, cash. Uh, it's a high margin, which is what the top distributors look for, and we give great training and backup, so their, clinic, their distributor sales people know how to go out and sell it to clinicians. The average cost of therapy is going to be about 10 bucks a day, depending on the thing. The competitors I showed you, um, the black one in the middle is reimbursed in the States, about $1,000, I should have said that. That will give our distributors high margins already. Am I on time? Yeah. Right, okay. All right. So, conservative goals. Let me just whistle through this. Sorry, I get excited when I get on my subject. But then again, if I'm not excited, why would you be? Okay. Here's, here's just the last final slide. There are 366 million diabetics probably you know, a year ago. Now it's 20 million more. In the target markets, the so 36 target markets who can afford our product, there's probably 208 million. I'm saying 7% of those folks have a DFU. I'm saying we would estimate 15% of those people are already offloaded, and that's increasing daily. That gives us a 756 million pound opportunity, which is where I get the billion dollar opportunity from. My really low target is to say I can capture 3.8% market share, which will give us 84,000 boots, which is about a 30 million pound revenue stream uh, at an average selling price of 360 quid. Gentlefolk, I am sorry for rushing this. There's so much to tell you. I'm on stand 27. I'm here all week. No, sorry, that's wrong. Um, uh, we're on stand 27. If you have any interest in diabetes, diabetic foot ulcers, come and see me and I'll explain it in more detail at a slower pace. Thank you very much. Firstly, uh, Stand 61, we're at for anybody who wants to come and talk in detail. And as well as myself, there is David Carrasco, who is the Director of Finance on the Mantatis site. So do feel free to come and visit and talk in detail. Thank you. A lot to get through in 10 minutes. Standard disclaimer, we can jump. First of all, major shareholders. We have 49% in the fairly um, in, in, in major shareholders, which are serious investors, and they've been there for some time. Uh, and on London and the Toronto Stock Exchange, another 51% numbers of small investors that have been with the company for some time, including myself. A slide, there's been a number of um, in the people in the company, but the two important ones are Isaac Kareb and Alberto Levadera. De Levadera. They're the two new Spanish-focused managers. Isaac is a very heavyweight, very well-known, respected business figure in Spain. For example, he was the managing director of Glencore from 1990 to 2003 in Spain. Alberto Lavadera is, amongst other things, the CEO of Emed Tartessis. He has brought numbers of mines into production in Spain. <clears throat> so it's one thing to run an operating mine. It's another thing to start a mine up and bring it into production. He's the perfect person to get Emed the Rio Tinto mine into production now. These are very important people, and the board has brought the right people in at exactly the right time. They need a little, a little bit of time to settle in. Alberto, for example, has only been on the site for the last two weeks. Okay? But they will push the project forward at speed. For those who've watched, who've watched this company for some time, we put this slide up wherever we go every year. It's a long slide. But post-2010, the focus has been on Rio Tinto, the project it's permitting. In the bottom right-hand corner, it says AAU, that's the Environmental Authority received quarter one of this year, the, the administrative stress standing, which is the transfer of the mineral rights, approved in early quarter two. It's going to be a mine, we can go ahead. Okay? We had the, uh, the Presidente of Junta de Aon, Lucia, some weeks ago at the site to say that the administrative standing was passing through. So at last, for long, long focused shareholders, at last, at last, we're past the tipping point. We're into making an operation. To sum it up in, in where it is, southwest corner of Spain, the key environmental, uh, the, the, the key uh, permits have been approved. I've put down here our resource and reserves. Uh, restart focus now. There is still some more permitting to do, but it is processional. We are looking at finance and have been for some time. We have a consortium of four banks that have been involved for some time, been to the site, they're comfortable, they're comfortable with the project. We are looking at dealing through to that to getting the, finance, the, the uh, debt finance for putting it into production in about September. With the new Spanish management, there is also some 
early discussions with some, some serious Spanish groups as well. So that'll be September. Uh, we're doing pro the project planning and the pre-works. The administrative standing now <coughs> allows us to start doing some work, to start doing construction, to start doing refurbishment, to start drilling, for example. Okay, the, <coughs> the other uh, permits, final restoration plan, mining project approval, they are due process. For example, the mining project approval has to be completed in six months, not whether it drifts off into the mirage over a year or two. It's a legal requirement to complete in six months. And that will tie in, with these permits will tie in with when we do the financing in September, okay? In the meantime, <coughs> looking at it, as I said, we can start some of the refurbishment, start some of the fixing up of old equipment, we can start drilling. And Alberto on the site at the moment is going through all of the pre-plans and the things that have been put before to see what order and priority he wants to put it in. And I, for one, when I get back, will be pushing quite hard to get some drilling done early, okay, as I'm a chief geologist. <clears throat> so, resources and reserves, this is uh, what we call our base case, 123 million tonnes of ore, 600,000 tonne of copper. It's designed as a 14-year mine life, um, but that's there. <clears throat> How do you increase it? Because we get this thing going, it'll be a bigger mine, and with this management, this won't be the only project that comes on board. So, just quickly to finish off, because I'm the Chief Geologist, some upside opportunity. <clears throat> the, the yellow is the pit, our 14-year mine plan. All of the red is, I think for some total now, of about 7,000 old historic maps that we've digitised and put together. And as a simple pattern, it says it's not just a pit that will mine for 14 years, there is a field of things to do. Go and look at all these other things over time. Get a bigger pit, go back into the underground. Right, so we have <coughs> the Cerro Colorado pit, and one of the things to do is to do more drilling programs and expand, and expand the pit. We have these old underground mines, San Dionisio and San, and San Antonio. San Dionisio, for example, has a thousand drill holes mm. underground. Okay, <coughs> and <coughs> they're polymetallic, so they're They've got slightly different metallurgy and processes, but there's big tonnages of them sitting next to our existing pit. We have 30 odd million tonnes of old tailings that have got gold and silver in it that we've identified from the past and the joint venture on that and we'll be doing some test work on that for the future. It's the equivalent of about a million ounces of gold. Secondary to the copper operation, but it's there. And <coughs> really the opportunity is to rise from the nine million tonne a year as we do resource conversions and discoveries and to pick it up and up and up and over time. But this thing gets going, you have a reasonable copper price, it'll still be here after I'm dead, actually, I think. I do, do, I do intend to live a little longer too. As an example, this uh, San Dionisio, <clears throat> underneath an old pit, over a thousand holes, 45 million tonnes. Now usually you've got to go and find something. Well, there's a thousand and eighty old drill holes there are issues of a pit full of water, there are, it's polymetallic, so the metallurgy will be different, but here's the opportunity to so say, what can we make of this? It's only a couple of hundred metres from our existing pit, okay? As an, I don't have to find it, we just have to investigate it. Another example, just one of the sections through our mine, <clears throat> this will be our, our pit, plus 1% copper. Down off the side, red is plus 1% copper, 60 metres of 1.6% copper sitting in here. The grey area, don't know. Drill some holes. This thing here, Romans mined it, Rio Tinto, the British mined it, and plus 10 million tonnes of plus 2% copper was mined out of here. What is this thing down here? You find, you find something like that, you just drive off the pit and pick it up. It's, there's some really simple exploration to do, okay? Following up existing data, really straightforward. One more example, another section on the mine. Over on this side, the pit comes down and picks up a high grade pod, red, the red here, 1% copper, where it's been mined before. And the pit stops here because down below there's no information. That's 1% to 2% copper in the bottom of the pit. Drill some holes underneath and see how much deeper you take the pit. It's a high grade zone running through, and if it gets deeper, come back underground. I've got several examples of this if you want to come to the booth and have a look. Sum up, permitting. At last, at last. The government's confirmed the timetable. The, the, the risk of slippage is minimal. 
And the further permitting is the due process that follows of the administrative standard. Standing, okay? We're often going to, to making an operating mine. We'll start with the 600,000 tonne of copper, the base case mine plan, but, except, but I think we can reasonably expect <coughs> in, a, in a quick time to start to expand the open pit and look at some of this underground potential. In a, const in a capex sense, it's a refurbishment, not a construction. We, you know, there's a lot of work to do, but there's a lot of the infrastructure that's sitting inside. 18 months is, I think, a reasonably conservative schedule to get the thing up and going and into full production in that time. That's quick to start a mine up. Okay? And <coughs> de-risk. There are proven capacities, pr proven metallurgical recoveries. It's not like we've done some bench tests. We're going to put the treatment plant, for example, back into a slightly more modern version of what it was before. It has produced copper concentrate before it's saleable. Right? It's a de-risk on that kind of thing. Strong shareholders, negotiations, advanced negotiations with the banking syndicates. And the last bit which is on the back burner there is plus two million ounces of gold and silver, one in Slovakia, which I haven't mentioned much, and another million ounces floating around the site at Rio Tinta. We'll attend them in due time. Thank you very much. Come to booth 61 if you have, if you want to have a discussion. That was the time. Thanks very much. As I say, my name's Joan Kelly from Manx Financial Group. I thought we heard it all this morning, from aircraft to gory pictures of feet uh, to mining, but uh, we've got something in store in last place with Manx Financial Group. I want you to um, remember three numbers from this morning. 300%. That's how much our share price has increased since the last Master Investor Show. Number two. Our PE ratio is 13 times. Number three, the PE ratio of the only listed comparative business is currently trading on 38 times. Why would anybody value a business at 38 times? Well, I'm going to explain why over the next five minutes. Manx Financial Group consists of three businesses. You've got Conister Bank, which is the most scalable business in the group and represents about 90% of the assets. It's a bank based on the Isle of Man, funded entirely by deposits that lends in the consumer and small business markets, both on the Isle of Man and increasingly in the UK, where, as you've been reading the papers, there's great demand for loans, particularly among small businesses. Edgewater Associates is an Isle of Man-based IFA, and Conister Card Services is our MasterCard prepaid cards business. Who are we? Our chairman, you will all know, he's the star speaker today. He's on at 12, uh, Mr. Jim Mellon. Myself, uh, bottom right there, Julian Kelly, picture of me when I was 25. Douglas Grant who is our group FD, and uh, we'll all be around today on stand 51 to talk to you further. As I said, the star asset in the group is, is a bank. That might surprise you, <coughs> because everybody hates banks. I imagine not many fans of banks in this room. Anybody love banks? Nobody, so you've equaled the previous best of zero. Why? Well, in a simple word, greed. Too much power in the hands of too few people. Picture of Fred the Shred there. And uh, if you think that the big banks, or the legacy banks as I call them, have got, have got it, you think they've learned the lesson, um, if, if there are any Barclays shareholders here, fresh from the AGM, you might tell me differently. What went wrong? Well, we've all been very generous as people. We've bailed out the big banks to the tune of 133 billion pounds. Um, there'll be a lot of nice yachts floating around the world in Monaco, thanks to your generosity. Now, the banks were too big to fail. That meant when they did fail, there was no choice but to bail them out. 
They're also too complex to manage, too big, involved in too many businesses. How can you manage a business like that? Well, history tells us you can't. Thirdly, driven by a desire to make more and more money, banks engaged in dubious practices, libel fixing, force feeding customers products they didn't want. And at the same time, more recently, restricting the supply of credit to the small businesses that need them. It's a pretty depressing picture. But you'll be glad to know that there's a revolution on the horizon. The future of banking looks very different. The future of banking sees a group of smaller regional banks replacing the large banks. Future of banking sees the smaller banks having more simple business models where they don't utilize depositors' money <coughs> to bet on derivatives markets, so-called casino banking. These new regional banks will have higher levels of capital to protect depositors against risk. The larger banks will in time be forced to open up their two secret weapons. One is distribution. The top clearing banks in the UK control 80% of distribution. Secondly, they own the payments network, which means nobody else can get access to it unless they go through a bank. And guess what? They're not very keen on showing that. So you've got regulatory pressures that are going to help change the industry. The regulators and government are serious about changing banking. But they've been serious before, and it hasn't worked. So what is different this time? Technology is the difference. For the first time, financial technology is changing the way people buy financial products. The beauty of that is you don't need a branch network to distribute and sell your products. You just need an IT system. You just need to hook into financial technology. That means that smaller banks, for the first time, will have access to markets they didn't previously have access to. What does that mean for our key asset within Max Financial Group, Conister Bank? It's a small regional bank. It's a challenger bank. It's a group of banks that are challenging the majors. We have a very simple business model in the bank. One, we look to distribute and sell digitally, not through bricks and mortar. Secondly, we take care of our balance sheet. We don't conduct in extreme maturity transformation. We don't take overnight money from the customers and lend it into the mortgage market for 25 years. If you want an example of that, it's Northern Rock. We have a high quality loan book that's experienced very low level of arrears throughout the financial crisis. We are well capitalized at over half, uh, over double the European average. And lastly, this may seem obvious, but we put our customers first because we know if you put them first, they'll come back to us and they will value what we do. This model is working for us. Last year, the group produced a net profit of 1.1 million. The loan book, as you can see on the charts there on the right, has grown at an average of 19% per annum for the last five years. And that growth accelerated last year up to 30% growth. We're doing that without putting the bank at risk. As I said, we're well capitalized at 16% risk asset ratio one of the highest levels in the UK. Our return on equity was almost 13%. Again, one of the highest rates for UK banks. And that's just the beginning. We're looking to build on that, of course. We expect growth to continue and that to translate through the bottom line. But why us? 
Why Manx Financial Group rather than any other bank? Well, that's based on what we believe. One, we believe we should act in the best interest of our customers. First and foremost, we don't cross sell to our we don't cross sell to our <coughs> customers. We don't force feed them things they don't want. And we don't bundle products, just like the music industry. You don't want to buy the album, you just want to buy the song. We also <coughs> thank you. We also believe that regional banks will replace the larger banks. And when that comes back again, there it is on there, you'll see that the top five banks in the UK control 80% of the market. Compare that to the United States, where the top five control under 50%. Show you there there's a lot more competition and smaller players have more of a role to play. And as I mentioned, digital innovation is revolutionizing this industry. In short, Max Financial Group is well placed for growth. We believe we are shaping the future of banking. Thank you. <laughs>